Thanks, Emily, for the presentation, for the introduction. This is absolutely terrifying, standing in front of people after three years of being alone at home. So please indulge. Uh, before I get to possible futures for Jupiter, I just wanted to say a little bit more about myself. So I'm the founder of QuantStack. Uh, QuantStack is a team of open source developers working on some of the major pro you know, projects and software of the open source stack that we all know and love, such as Jupyter, Candaforge, and a lot more. Uh, we're primarily based in France, Germany, uh, Austria, and in the UK. Uh, so you can check out QuantStack. Um, as an open source developer, I'm mostly involved in the Jupyter uh, project and Candaforge. And I'm also doing a lot of, open, uh, I would say, volunteer work as a director of NumFocus and the organizer of the PyData Paris Meetup. So before I get to the possible futures, I just wanted to give you a quick update on what's going on in the Jupyter project. But wait, do you all understand my... Americanized French. This is going <laughs> all right. Um, so the f one of the most exciting things that happened uh, in the past year in the Jupyter Lab project is the introduction of the Jupyter Lab visual debugger. So you can now actually debug notebooks and files interactively in Jupyter Lab as of Jupyter Lab 3.0. Um, this is still ongoing a lot of, there is a, still a lot of uh, improvements to that ongoing, and Jupyter Lab 4 will be even better. But, well, it's based on the, the DAP from Microsoft, it's language agnostic, and uh, we already have three kernels supporting debugging. The next exciting development of the past year in Jupyter Lab was the collab collaborative editing in Jupyter Lab, in the sense of, you know, collaborative editing just like in Google Docs. Um, it's been a long-standing request of the community for many years, and our implementation is based on CRDTs, which are conflict-free replicated data types, so you have automatic uh, resolving of conflicts. Uh, so we support undo, redo by users, etc. and for JupyterLab 4, a major refactor is ongoing, uh, introducing role-based access control, um, improving stability of collaborative editing, and providing persistent collaborative editing sessions so that you can undo your changes uh, since the very beginning of your document. Um, Jupyter Lab 4 will also be a lot faster. So Frederick Colonval, who works uh, with me at Quantstack, has started his effort to improve the Jupyter Lab uh, performances with um, the development of a benchmarking tools. And after we were able to measure performance uh, in a more scientific way, we did some major improvements to the rendering of Jupyter Notebooks, to the table of content and the search tools, and there are even greater improvements coming up for 4.0 with the virtual rendering of notebooks so that we only really render the parts of the notebook that are currently in the screen. Uh, so, yeah, and so the benchmarks that you can see on the right are actually produced by this new benchmarking tool, and they show the improvements coming from the update to Code Mirror 6, which is the, the, the text editor that we use for JupyterLab. Now, another really important development going on right now in the, by, and done by other members of the community is the work on accessibility. So one in five people, which is really a large proportion, has a physical, visual, auditory, cognitive, or neurological disability that makes using web applications difficult. And this gets even more difficult with complex applications like Jupyter. So the Trans Zuckerberg Initiative is funding a team at QuantSight to improve this situation in the Jupyter project. So there is a, most of the code focus goes to Jupyter Lab, and they are working right now on automated testing, documentation, and outreach. Um, another thing, still in Jupyter Lab, the language server protocol which is what powers, you know, the refactoring abilities of VS Code and, you know, the warnings and autocomplete uh, based on static analysis of the code is becoming core to JupyterLab. So this has been developed for several years by um, uh, Michel and Nick as an extension, and now this is being integrated into core JupyterLab. So that's for JupyterLab. Now, 
Has anyone in the room heard of Jupiter Light before? So that's not many, but I think this is one of the most transformative projects that will you know, really change the way you do interactive computing in, on the web. So Jupyter Lite is an in-browser distribution of Jupyter Lab. What it means is that the kernels, which normally run on the server side, now run in the web browser. Um, so it's a simple thing to do when it comes to JS-based kernels, such as a JavaScript kernel. But for the Python, we actually use a WASM-based distribution of CPython provided by the Pyodite project. Um, benefits of this are a high scalability because you don't need to provide an elastic cloud infrastructure to serve many, many users on the web. You can simply serve all of this, you know, your kernel and all of the packages that are required to run your computation as static assets alongside your HTML and JavaScript. And it now powers the interactive shells on the numpy.org and simpy.org websites. So you can try it out. There is a live console that serves the million of, millions of monthly visitors of numpy.org um, right in the front page. And when you load it, there is, you don't have a dedicated server. There is no Docker image running for you in the background. You just run CPython in the browser. And that comes with NumPy, SimPy, SciPy, batteries included. You can do plotting and everything. And it's really hard to understate the importance of that. On top of JupyterLite, we're now working on a successor to Pyodide based on the Mamba package manager. So for those who don't know Mamba, Mamba is a C++ re-implementation of Kanda that produces a much faster experience for Kanda and can also be built in WebAssembly. So the goal of this new distribution called mscript and forge is to enable long-term long -term reproducibility or binder-like environment so that you can distribute all of the packages that you need for a given computation as a bundle alongside your notebook on a web page without having to do any server infrastructure. Other ongoing developments. We have been telling the community that Jupyter Lab was going to replace the classic notebook for many years. But many users were very attached to the classic notebook user interface and were complaining that we were not maintaining that package so much anymore. And so instead of sunsetting the notebook, we made the decision to sunrise the classic notebook and to create a classic notebook experience that would be based on the same technical foundations as JupyterLab, but you know, uh, with all of the you know, new developments that came into JupyterLab, such as collaborative editing, debugging, and whatnot. So in the Jupyter enhancement proposal, the Jupyter leadership um, voted that Notebook 7.0 will retain the document-centric interface and provide a very similar UI to the Notebook V6. And we will port the main missing extensions to the JupyterLab extension system, such as RISE and NB Greater, if you are using Jupyter for teaching. And there are already pre-releases available for Notebook 7, and this is actually what you get when you hit try the Jupyter Notebook on the Jupyter website already. So this was just a sneak peek on what's going on right now in the Jupyter ecosystem. There is a lot more that I haven't talked about, like Jupyter Book for to build beautiful publication quality books and documents from computational documents, content. Jupyter Hub, obviously, Voila, which turns notebooks into standalone applications and dashboards. Binder, Jupyter Games, if you haven't looked at Jupyter Games yet, check it out. It's really awesome. Now, on the community side, um, we, by we, I mean here the Jupyter community and the Jupyter uh, Community Building Committee hired a new event organizer for uh, building up uh, the two main programs that we, we've had so far. The um, uh, JupyterCon conference, which already happened three times, and uh, the Jupyter community workshops. So, um, Gail, yeah, this is Gail. 
Gail Orlington, and she joined the team <laughs> a few months ago, so please give her a round of applause. I can't, stay, I, can't, I can't say too much, but we're working on bringing back TripitCon in 2023. <laughs> um, another really important thing that's going on at the social side of the Jupyter project is that there is a major refactor of the Jupyter governance ongoing. So the main goals of that refactor were, was to ensure that the project governance reflects our values and supports the growth of the project. And we also want that Jupyter remains a multi-stakeholder project and is not controlled by a single group organization. So for two years, the new governance has been developed by community members and voted upon by the current project leadership in a series of weekly calls. So it's basically a constitution. Um, important parts of the new governance are already in effect. There, we now have a body of Jupyter Distinguished Contributors, which is um, um, an award that we um, give every year to major contributors to the project. We now have sub-project councils for the main sub-projects of the of Jupyter project. And we have the Jupyter Software Steering Council that is, that is uh, now being set up. Um, yeah, as I was showing all of these slides, I, I showed like the, the pictures of the main people involved in these aspects, and that's all of them. And this is only a small portion of the Jupyter development community. So let's talk about the future. So here are the rules of the game. I'll be making some bold claims about possible futures for Jupyter but it's not an official roadmap. Don't quote me on that as this is what the project, the project is going to do, right? This, some of them are just around the corners, but others are mere possibilities, right? And, and my claims are going to get bolder and bolder. So it's just an opinionated take. So in the future, Jupyter Lite will enable the next 10 million Jupyter users and more. Why? So the scalability. Anyone who can host static assets on the web can embed a console on their website without coding to a third-party service or anything. If you can host an Apache server somewhere, that will work. And it already powers the interactive shells of websites that have millions of visitors monthly, right? such as Jupyter and NumPy. So it really lowers the bar to deploy a Jupyter-based teaching platform. You don't, you don't need a scalable cloud infrastructure. So countries and teaching institutions that don't have that kind of, of infrastructure readily available for them won't need to rely on other countries to deploy a sovereign uh, service for, for their schools and universities. And I, I can't really overstate how important that is. Uh, so what I think will happen is that high schoolers around the world will learn the basics of Python and other common scripting language in their web browser. In the future, JupyterLite and Epsilon Forge, which is this new WASM distribution that we're building, will enable long-term software reproducibility. So Epsilon Forge brings the power of the Mamba and Kanda package managers to the web browser so that the entire execution environment can be bundled, bundled in, this, in the form of static assets for a website. So this static bundle is a time capsule for reproducing your computation in the long run. So Wasm is a web standard. So it's very likely that binaries that you build now in Wasm will have will be executable for a much longer period of time than something that you build for today's version of Linux on an x86 platform, right? It's very likely to still run in a few decades from now. So in the future, entire curricula will be built upon computational documents. So this actually is a quote of Lorena Barba's presentation uh, at uh, SIPA, I think, uh, a few years back. Jupyter will be key in, implement, in implementing computational thinking. So learning how to build Jupyter applications will support solving problems 
in all disciplines. So the, the problem we have at the moment is that computing and programming is taught as a separate subject and not really used for teaching uh, history, biology, and whatnot at, you know, in high schools and lower levels. And what we think is that we should put this into action and into use as early as possible in the curriculum of these subjects. Um, in the future, Jupiter will be accessible to everyone. Why? Because we really don't have a choice. One in five people need, has a disability that can make using web applications difficult. So we cannot address an entire generation of new developers and students without fixing that. So what's Jupiter doing about it? So there is a CZI-funded grant, a CZI-funded team at Quantsite. Uh, at Quantstack, we're also working on a grant for Jupiter in Education that has a strong focus on accessibility. There, there is some ongoing development. Uh, we are migrating Jupiter Lab to Code 6. So this brings some performance improvements, but it also makes um, is a critical steps toward, towards making Jupiter accessible. In the future, JupyterLab will serve as the foundation for specialized technical computing, not just development or data science. Just think about it. If you're looking for a good framework to build a complex application, I don't know, maybe an email client, a photo editing software, a CAD modeler, an IDE, from scratch, you need a plugin system, you need common plugins for themes, command palette, file browsing, a settings editor, you need integrated tools for, regression, for visual regression testing and benchmarks. You need the foundations to make your application collaborative. You shouldn't start from scratch. You should use an existing generic set of foundations to build such an application. And this is already the case. Like JupyterLab Ross, Elira, Quetz, JupyterLite are remixes of JupyterLab extensions and many more. So my claim is that the future of CAD or photo editing may actually rely on the same foundations that we built to make JupyterLab. And actually, in the future, your go-to IDE for C++ development may actually be built on JupyterLab. We're already working on that, providing visual debugging experience to JupyterLab, supporting you know, the LSP protocol. So if you are building an IDE or if you are building IDE extensions, you shouldn't build on borrowed land, right? So VS Code is only partly open source, right? It's great, but we, you don't get to choose the direction and it, the, the ground may shift under your feet, right? So if you really want to be part of a community where you can have a weight, I think that JupyterLab is a much better bet. In the future, all web-based authoring software will be collaborative. And by collaborative, I mean collaborative in the collaborative editing sense. And well, we've known, we all know since the pandemics that you know, using shared document to build you know, a roadmap or something that you have to work on with peers is completely ubiquitous for text-based documents, right? And the way we have solved this in JupyterLab using YJS is actually not specific to textual content. It will work for other kinds of structured data, such as CAD, or photo editing. And my claim is that in the future, if you want to build a web-based experience for photo editing or CAD, you will want to make it collaborative. You will want to have people in the same company who work on the same 3D model, I don't know, for a jet engine to be able to look at it together in a, in a real-time real fashion. You want the person that's the closest to the silicone making simulations in the jet engine to be able to annotate the same document as someone who's working in the shed and, look and is closer to the metal. So, 
these were bold claims. Um, I think that they're not so crazy, but well, they're not all true right now. So I hope that you will help contribute to them and make them a reality. Thank you.